All right. All these will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel at the UWEX Lakes. So if you'd like to view it at a later time, you can just search UWEX Lakes on YouTube. You'll find a bunch of different videos that we've produced, um, including some videos from the Wisconsin Lakes Convention, past events, and other workshops and events that we've been a part of. Um, for this webinar, you can use the chat function in Zoom to ask questions. I'll take all the questions at the end and uh, just keep answering questions as they come in until we run out of time. So the first thing that I'll start off with is a, a critter that went from a neat local finding in this area to a national headline in a few hours. And I've got a video that I'll pull up here from CNN. Um, this this video uh, or this this finding was part of a local press release that I put together just in central Wisconsin and went to national news within a few hours. It was amazing how uh, quickly they picked it up, but they kind of put a, a more ominous spin on the story than was necessary, but I'm sure that was effective at getting some more people to to view it. A jellyfish found in a freshwater lake in Wapaka County is causing a stir in Northeast Wisconsin, especially for... Can someone just confirm that they can hear the, the audio on this, this video? Yeah, sounds good, Paul. All right, great. Thanks, Scott. Bonnie Plunkett, who's lake. lived by the lake for 48 years. A gentleman came to the back door after fishing and asked if I knew that there were jellyfish in the lake. Did I have ever heard of it? I said no and so he said well I got one about two inches around. I'm looking down and it's a bit murky to see a small clear jellyfish but a boater did spot one here on this lake last week and it's probably not the only one. I probably saw 25 or 30 out there I would imagine there's a whole lot more I was just in one small area of the lake. Paul Skowinski is an aquatic species specialist. He says there are 96 known jellyfish sites in Wisconsin, but the freshwater species is actually native to China. These species and, and many other aquatic invasive species are introduced here by people dumping aquariums or water garden plants and animals. Dumping aquariums is illegal, often introducing unknown foreign species. Skowinski says luckily freshwater jellyfish pose no threat. They do have stinging cells on their tentacles like all jellyfish do, but the cells are so small that they really have no effect on humans. But that doesn't mean Plunkett isn't surprised. Quite stunned. <laughs> to learn of a jellyfish in her front yard. All right, so that was amusing. Uh, you can see they- We work really hard and we're kind of intense. We sweat, we bust our butt, and if I didn't enjoy what I was doing, I. All right, and to get rid of that. All right, um, so moving on to the, the jellyfish to begin with. This is a, a species that is native to China. We do have about 100 populations here in Wisconsin. Um, and the, uh, the native range of this jellyfish is continuously under debate because they are mostly water and have a little bit of soft tissue, but they don't have anything that leaves any kind of fossil evidence. So it's really hard to determine where they're full native range is. Uh, in Wisconsin here, we first saw them in the 1960s when they were reported in the southwest part of the state. And they are slowly being reported in more areas, uh, very often by scuba divers because they're easier seen when you're in the water with them. Uh, any bit of glare on the surface of the water makes it really hard to detect these tiny, nearly transparent critters. And we don't know of any significant impacts of these things. They are eating plankton in the water, but uh, probably not harming any significant part of the food web. They are not harmful to people or pets. They, as I said in that uh, interview, they do have tiny cells on their tentacles. They're called nematocysts. And they are sort of like little harpoons that fire off and stab their prey and inject a little bit of poison to paralyze them. But they're not harmful to anything unless you're a, a tiny zooplankton swimming in the water. They're about the size of a nickel. You can see why they're hard to detect if they're nickel sized and basically transparent. And for the most part, they live on the bottom of the lake attached to wood or uh, rocks and things like that as a polyp. 
and they filter feed plankton out of the water. Uh, when the conditions are just right, this can be over the, a period of multiple years that can survive as a polyp. They will uh, detect conditions that are appropriate, which are typically in late summer when the water is, is in the 70s or 80s. And at that point, they transition to their mature adult stage called the medusa stage. And that's what you see in the photographs here. So that's really when people are likely to see them. If they're going to see them at all, it will be in this stage, which lasts for about four to six weeks at the end of the summer. All right, moving on to another one that's very commonly uh, sent to me in, in picture form is the bryozoans, which are tiny little animals. Uh, again, these are filter feeders like the jellyfish polyps. And they have little combs that they reach out on these little arms, kind of like you'd expect to see on a barnacle or something like that along the coastline. So they're filter feeding plankton and, and algae particles out of the water. Each one of the individuals on the colony of a bryozoan colony is called a zooid. And the zooids have many different roles within the colony. Um, you can see how they have this texture where it's very lumpy. And each one of those lumps is a, a small group that is continuously cloning itself. So they're producing lots of genetically identical individuals. And below those individuals, they secrete this jelly-like substance that uh, combines with water to create the majority of that, that mass that is the bryozoan colony. So the individuals that are alive are really only on the outside and they expand the size of the colony as a whole to increase surface area of it and allow for more space for those individuals to grow. So here you can see the, the same colony here taken with an underwater camera on the left and then I pulled it out of the water to see, uh, to show you what it looks like out of the water. They do hold their shape pretty well but a very large one that's, they can get up to the size of about a basketball or so. And those are kind of hard to hold because they are heavy and they tend to sag and, and start to fall apart out of water. Um, here's one on the left that I found this last summer. I was out paddling with some kids in a canoe and uh, I was delighted they were even willing to touch it, but they were actually really excited to put their hands all over it and uh, really, check it out really good. So that was cool. Um, on the right, you can see a, a photograph of an individual zooid of a bryozoan colony. And so you can see those little arms that come out and they filter feed little particles out of the water. As I mentioned, all the zooids in a colony are genetically identical. They are just clones of the parent and they all provide different services to the colony. So some of them have a defense role. Some of them are just uh, for feeding, some of them for more reproduction. So they all have their own purposes to each individual colony. And I put a lot of these um, locations where I've taken these pictures on the slide so everybody can see. Maybe there's a lake near you where you can see uh, one of these critters and maybe you'll go check it out next year. This is another kind of bryozoan that's much less common, the Christatella. Um, these two, the, these bryozoans really don't have common names, so all I've included there is the Latin name. Um, this one likes to grow as sort of a worm or snake-like appearance on rocks. You'll find it right next to the other one, the Pectinatella, the big one that we just looked at. And in fact, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor here, I think you can, but on the bottom of the photo here, you can see some of the round, uh, round colonies here that could be the, the other uh, genus, the Pectinatella, growing right alongside this other one. So these colonies can live for multiple years, but an individual blob, if you want to call it that, does not survive into the next year. So it will dry up or it will fall apart as the water temperatures get low. If the water level goes down, it will just fall apart and dry out in the air. But at the end of the season, the colony starts to produce these special cells called statoblasts. And these are produced in the tens of thousands per colony. And they're basically dormant, um, super strong cells that are kind of shielded by the, 
sort of a shell on them, which protects them from drying out. It protects them from heat and from freezing. And some of them produce uh, little air pockets inside, so they're actually buoyant. And some of them fall off, they're, they're heavy, so they sink down to the bottom. Other ones will just remain on the parent colony. So they'll end up probably uh, falling off onto the log or the rock where the colony was growing the previous season. And they will actually regenerate a new colony that same, in that same spot. So if you see a big bryozoan colony from year to year in the same place, it's probably from a statoblast that just settled out onto the same log and began a new colony the next season. Otherwise, the ones that fall off could be transported by wind or waves or things that are moving from one lake to, a net, to another. This one I had to put in here because it is Halloween time. Um, Jenny Greenteeth is a mythical creature uh, in England that was said to lurk in small lakes and ponds with her sisters, waiting to drag in unsuspecting children. And this was really a, a form of social control to keep children from wandering near wetlands and small lakes, uh, duckweed and other things that grow on these small lakes and other stagnant waters can often look sort of like a solid surface. And so to keep kids from running out onto these solid surfaces, I guess they would, they would uh, tell the legend of Jenny Green Teeth pulling kids in if they get too close to the water. There's actually even a song uh, called Jenny Green Teeth by a heavy metal band. Um, so it's been uh, even told through the heavy metal music scene. So here's a duckweed species on the lower left, small duckweed, a really common species around here. And uh, in England, Jenny Green Teeth is still a common name for duckweeds. And the duckweed was said to be the shed teeth of Jenny Green Teeth. And filamentous algae, which you can sort of see uh, depicted in the illustration here, is said to be the shed hair of Jenny and her sisters. All right, moving on to another one that, that actually does exist, the whirligig beetles. Most of you have probably seen these just going for a boat ride around the lake. You'll see these things just zigzagging right in front of the boat or right alongside the boat. Um, they're called whirligig beetles. They swim in a, a definite zigzag. It's a way of avoiding predators. And they have a very smooth shell and a very fast movement. So they're extremely hard to catch. Uh, most predators tend to just ignore them and they don't even bother trying to catch them. Um, they, their coolest feature, I think, is that they have two sets of eyes. And the red line here in the photo is depicting the water line. So these critters will zigzag along the surface and they'll use their upper eyes to look for predators that are coming from above or in front of them. And they'll use the lower eyes to look for predators underneath or to look for prey items underneath that they can go after. So they can dive underwater, they can take a bubble of, of air with them and dive underwater and use that to breathe for a couple of minutes. So if they need to dive down to hide in some plants or something away from a predator, they can do that. Or they can dive down to chase some kind of prey item if they want. This one is, is perhaps my favorite fish, a very misunderstood fish, uh, top predator of a lot of lakes, including certainly northern Wisconsin lakes. It's very common. Um, here's one shown in Spring Lake in Washera County. The bowfin is in the fossil record from over, well, that should actually be 100 million years ago, not 100,000 years ago. So there, it's a very a prehistoric fish. It has a really long dorsal fin that goes almost from the gills uh, all the way to the tail. And they can wave this back and forth. They can send waves in either direction, front to back or back to front. And they'll often just kind of alternate back and forth. So if you're snorkeling and you get to see one of these or diving, uh, it's really just cool to see them, to see that fin going back and forth. And you can see in the picture here, the, the fin is doing that wave back and forth. Uh, very interesting looking fish. They also have a circular tail and they have a bright spot at the base of the tail that almost looks like a cigarette burn on a piece of paper or something. So really unique appearance to it. You'll see that spot in the next photo. 
And these, these fish can breathe dissolved oxygen and they can breathe atmospheric oxygen. They use it for two different purposes. The bowfin was thought to be one of the earliest fish, if not the earliest fish to develop a swim bladder. And many fish have these. Uh, it's the reason why a bluegill can just raise straight up and down in the water column without moving its fins at all. It's because it's changing the body density, its own body density by pumping air or gases into the swim bladder or removing them. So it can just move straight up and down in the water column. Um, a bowfin will breathe dissolved oxygen for the most part, but if the water, uh, the dissolved oxygen in the water gets really low, it can resort to gulping air from the surface and it will also use the air from the surface to quickly fill its swim bladder. So it can direct all that air directly to the swim bladder and uh, quickly change its buoyancy. And that's thought to be a very important uh, evolutionary advantage to the bowfin because 100 million years ago, according to the fossil evidence, most fish at the time were bottom feeders. So the bowfin uh, having the swim bladder had a distinct advantage that it could really uh, live and feed in the upper parts of the lake without exerting a lot of energy to stay upward. Um, any other fish would have had to continuously swim upward to, to stay high up in the water column and the bowfin would not have had to do that. So uh, here's a picture that this is one that I caught 10 years ago uh, on the willow flowage which is where the state record was caught. Um, this was a, a, a good example you can see the spot on the base of the tail there where it looks like a cigarette burn or some kind of a uh, burn on a piece of paper. So a very distinct looking fish. Uh, I often think it looks somewhat like a smallmouth bass crossed with an eel. It's got a really slender body but kind of a, a smallmouth looking head to it uh, and coloration. They can be all kinds of different colors though. They can be brown, they can be green, they can be almost white and almost black. Um, especially in, in different kinds of habitats, they'll adapt to be darker in darker water. Um, and down south in the uh, southern states, Texas and Oklahoma, they see really big ones that tend to be almost black sometimes. Um, oh, they mostly feed on crayfish. They are a top predator in the system, so you will find them lurking around plants usually. Same place you'd see a muskie or a pike. Uh, you'll find bowfin sitting there also. They are ambush predators, so they'll target anything that swims by. Uh, it could be a frog on the surface, it could be a fish going by, but they really do seem to prefer crayfish based on uh, studies of the diet of, of bowfin, looking at their stomach contents and things. This is one that I found in Lake Tomahawk when I was looking for aquatic plants, actually, for a workshop. I came across this, this big school of bowfin fry. Um, adorable little fish. Um, they lay their eggs on vegetation, so the fry will often be found in very shallow, uh, heavily vegetated areas. It's a type of fish, a category of fish known as a broadcast spawner, which means that they, the female simply broadcasts out a large number of eggs that are sticky, and those eggs stick to vegetation and develop uh, right there on the vegetation. So other fish that do the same thing include muskies, pike, carp, a lot of things in the minnow family. So it's a, a common way for fish to reproduce and it uses a lot less energy than having to dig out a, a dinner plate nest like a bluegill or a largemouth bass would. So the fry are developing in this heavy vegetation where they're well protected from other things and the male will guard all these fry. They tend to gather into a ball shape in the water and they swim as a ball and the male will closely follow this ball wherever they go and uh, direct them into safer areas and protect them from anything that, that might be a threat. So uh, they have been known to jump out at deer and other things that are walking around in the water too close to the fry balls. They will leap themselves out of the water. Um, they'll attack other fish or turtles or things like that that may be coming after the fry. And honestly, when I found that bowfin fry in Lake Tomahawk, I was sort of suspecting that at some point I might be hit by a flying fish, but it never did happen. Moving back into the insect world, one of the coolest 
insects, I think, in, in streams and lakes are the caddisflies. And this is a pretty big group of insects. Most of them will make a case that they transport with them. So think hermit crab type thing. You've got a, a soft insect that is carrying around a protective case that is somewhat camouflage and somewhat uh, physical protection for the, the insect inside. In the photo here, this is a rock pulled out of um, Lawrence Creek in Marquette County. And this is a really nice cold water trout stream. Um, on this one rock, you can see several different kinds of caddisfly homes. The one on the far right is one of the log cabin caddisflies. Uh, they, the, there's a common name just for that family, the log cabin caddisflies. It's the Brachycentridae family. They only build these four-sided homes out of tiny, tiny pieces of wood. So they cement those together with uh, silk and a, a sticky substance that they can secrete from their mouth. So they can glue all this stuff together and they create these, these perfectly four-sided log cabin looking um, houses that they carry around with them. All the caddisflies will use their house to disguise themselves so a fish or other predator will not realize that it's actually a, a tasty little insect. It looks like a pile of sticks or sand. Uh, the one dominating this photo is the uh, Glossosomatidae family of caddisflies. They don't have any common name that I'm aware of, but they create this little dome of sand particles and uh, tiny gravel particles. So they cement that all together. They have an opening on the bottom near the front and they walk along uh, scraping the rock, scraping algae and things off of the rock or filter feeding things that, that come across them. And then in the background here, out of focus, you can see this little tent looking thing in the background. And that is a different family. This is a, the same, same rock, uh, different photograph. You can see this little tent that was built with a web inside. And on that web is all this stuff that has floated downstream, algae and other organic material that has floated down and accumulated on that web of silk. So that was produced by a different kind of caddisfly that does not make a case. And typically these are just called the non-case-making caddisflies, the hydro, uh, hydropsychidae family. Oh yeah, I have it written right there. Um, so they build a little tent, they spin this web in there and they go hide in a crack in a rock or a log for the rest of the day. And then at night they'll come out and they'll scrape all the good stuff off of that web and repair anything that needs to be repaired on the web itself and then go back to hiding for the rest of the day again. So they just go out there and clean it every day or mean, do any kind of maintenance that needs to be done to keep it operating and go and, and hide for the majority of the day. Since they do not have a protective case, they're really susceptible to things eating them. This is an interesting uh, business idea that somebody came up with a while ago. Um, you, you can see a picture on the left there of some earrings that were produced and there's some other jewelry being made in the photographs on the right. But what this person does is to bring a bunch of caddisflies, case making caddisflies obviously, into an aquarium and the aquarium doesn't have any natural materials in it like uh, plant material or wood or sand. But instead, the substrate of the aquarium is made entirely of precious metals and pearls and things like that. So the caddisflies will grab these precious metals and other uh, jewelry materials and create a case out of them. So she then sells these cases as part of jewelry. So on the left, you can see those earrings that are $425 for these hoop earrings with uh, caddisfly cases built into them. And so she has things that are made with crystal and uh, diamond flex and gold and various other materials. So uh, the website there, wildscape.com, is where I found that earring and you can see some of the things that this person has for sale. All right, getting back into 
more creepy crawly stuff. The six spotted fishing spider is a, a really neat spider that gets to uh, almost the size of a, your palm uh, with its legs spread out. So they can be very big, several inches across easily. And they are pretty common statewide. They're sometimes called dock spiders because you'll see them crawling underneath docks around dock posts pretty commonly. The six spotted one has the spots on the top. You'll see there's actually more than six spots on the top because the six spotted part of its name comes from the six spots that are on its belly, which you cannot see in, that, uh, in those photos. But they have the, a bright stripe along the, the sides of their body and the spots on the top. These things can walk right on the top of water. Um, they have lots of hairs along the tips of their legs so they can actually hold themselves up with the surface tension of the water. And they'll usually be hiding on a lily pad or on a dock or a stick next to the water or something like that. And they'll run out over the water to capture things. They will dive into the water. They can take a bubble with them and use that to breathe and they can actually hunt underwater for a period of a few minutes. So they're pretty versatile and they will go after insects and tadpoles or even small fish or small frogs if the spider is big enough. One of the coolest things that they can do is a technique called ballooning. It's a way of transporting themselves and I got to see this firsthand uh, before I knew what a fishing spider was. I saw this just sort of on accident when I was out kayaking on a lake. The, there was a fishing spider that was on some cattails and I was paddling through an open area at a boat landing, the cattails on one side, a lot of open water where I was, and then lily pads on the other side. And as I paddled close to these cattails, the fishing spider suddenly just let go of the cattail and was floating through the air over me. And uh, later on, as I watched this thing, as it, the, the angle toward the spider changed, you could see that there was a thread of silk that was pointing up into the air from the spider. And so what they do is they fire off a big line of silk into the wind. The wind catches that line, the spider hangs onto it, and it carries them to some other location. Uh, in this case, it was apparently startled and was just, maybe it had some place in mind, maybe it didn't, but it just got carried away by the wind and eventually settled down into the lily pads uh, pretty far from me. So it's a, a way of avoiding predators probably, or uh, maybe quickly just dispersing itself to a different location. But a really cool technique, whatever they use it for. This is a shot from last summer uh, that I thought was just fun. Uh, we've got a, a big six spotted fishing spider looking at a bullfrog and I'm not sure who made the next move, um, but it was fun to just sit there and look at them for a minute. This is another species of fishing spider, the dark fishing spider. This is on the bill of a hat, as you can see. So this is a big spider. This was along the Wisconsin River uh, this summer. And underneath the spider, you see an egg sac. So when they, uh, their courtship actually lasts for over an hour. But when the eggs are finally laid, the uh, female wraps them up into a ball of silk and carries them around until they start hatching out. So uh, after a while, these, these things begin to hatch and the female will spin a little nursery web, as they are called, which is where all the spiders will hatch out. And it's a little protected area. The female will stay there and protect the young as they live there for a couple of days until they first molt. And then at that point, everybody goes their own way. And the female will leave as well. All right, uh, one of the species that you're likely to see in the northern part of the state where there are more sphagnum bogs is the purple pitcher plant. This is a really interesting carnivorous plant. Uh, we don't have any other species of pitcher plant in Wisconsin. We just have the purple pitcher plant. But in other parts of the world, there are hundreds of other species of pitcher plant, most of them growing in bogs or even in, in trees, at the tops of trees, where they grow in, in crotches of the trees, um, places like that. And they eat anything from tiny bugs to frogs and mice, uh, depending on the species and where they are. They, uh, as you can imagine, some of them are much bigger if they can tackle a, a 
or handle eating a frog or a, a mouse or something. So in this case, the purple pitcher plant is an insect feeding plant. It grows in bogs. So if you have a lot of sphagnum moss uh, growing around your lake, you may see pitcher plants in there. And they just have these little leaves that come from the base. They are up to maybe seven or eight inches tall. And each one of them is formed into a pitcher. So it contains water, it holds rainwater, and it produces a small amount of digestive enzyme, uh, enzymes inside of the water, but has another trick up its sleeve, which I'll get into in just a sec here. In that main photo there, you can see there are a couple of insects that fell into the water. The hood on the back side here, uh, which you see in the upper left, is covered in these spikes or uh, teeth or sharp hairs that point down into the pitcher. So if an insect tries to climb out, it has nothing to grab onto because of all these spines that are pointing downward. So the insect typically will uh, continue trying to get out until it just is completely exhausted and falls back into the water and drowns from exhaustion. Uh, on the other side is a very slippery lip that is on the pitcher. And so things like ants will crawl up onto that slippery lip and they will fall into the pitcher because they, they just lose their, uh, their hold on that lip. But if that's not enough, the pitcher will produce, it has nectar glands uh, beyond that slippery lip. So inside of the pitcher itself, there are these glands that produce nectar. So the ants and things are uh, encouraged to come up to the edge and lean over and try to get this nectar from underneath. So often they will fall in because of that. But if that doesn't work, the nectar also produces a small amount of alcohol. So the ants and other creatures that crawl up there will ultimately get a little drunk on the nectar and then they will probably topple in if they haven't already. So there's multiple ways of the pitcher plant attracting prey into the, the water. On the, the far lower right, you can see a developing flower bud. And on the left, you can see an open flower bud. So it is a pretty spectacular flower if you get to see these out in the wild. Um, they bloom typically in um, early June around here in central Wisconsin, be a little bit later in the north. And those flowers stand about two feet high. So they're, they're pretty obvious towering above the mosses and other plants. So here we have a pitcher plant mosquito. This is a, an insect larva that lives inside the pitcher plant. And uh, the pitcher plants are carnivorous plants and they are feeding on insects that fall in, but the pitcher plant mosquito and the pitcher plant midge and the pitcher plant fly are three insects that can live in that water despite the digestive enzymes that are in there. They can still live just fine in that water and they actually help the pitcher plant to process prey items that fall into the water and make it easier for the pitcher plant to absorb the nutrition inside those, those prey. So the fly larva lives at the top of the water inside the pitcher. The mosquito larva lives in the middle of the water column inside the pitcher and the midge is at the bottom. So they have their own place in the pitcher to live. They have different roles. Um, the fly will shred up things a little bit. And then as, as these pieces rain down in the water, the mosquito larva then goes after them and shreds them up further. And then finally the midge will grab these fine um, materials of the insect and consumes those. Um, so all three of them, in addition to other bacteria and other tiny, tiny invertebrates that are growing in the water as well, they all are eating and they are all pooping into the water. And the insect poop really is what uh, gives the pitcher plant its food. The materials in that, that uh, material will dissolve out into the water in the pitcher and the pitcher plant itself will absorb the compounds, the nutrients and the minerals in the insect poop and use that to grow. So it's a really interesting system going on there. The pitcher plant, the purple pitcher plant specifically, is often used in ecosystem-wide 
uh, studies because it is an entire ecosystem contained within one pitcher. There's the plant, there's all these bacteria, there's these rotifers and other things that are known to be in there, tiny invertebrates. Then there are these mosquito, midge, and fly larvae, and they're all working together and, and uh, creating this whole little world inside of one pitcher. So where an ecologist wants to study an entire ecosystem in a small scale and be able to replicate it many times, this is an easy way for them to do that. Another uh, invertebrate that lives in the water is the sponge. We have one family of uh, freshwater sponges. They look like uh, green cushions if they're growing on rocks or logs or if they're growing uh, also on plants, you'll find them looking like a cushion. Or if they're growing out of the bottom of a lake, out of the sediments, they will tend to look like these long green fingers. Um, this picture here is from Porter's Lake in Washera County, uh, central Wisconsin. And this is a really common site in uh, many lakes that have good water quality. These are animals that are filter feeding against. They're often in areas where there's a little bit of wave action or a little bit of flow. <clears throat> and they are green, not because the animal itself is green, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, animal actually has an algae that grows within the cells of the animal. So that's what gives it its green color. The chlorophyll within the algae uh, is inside the cells of the sponge and giving it the green color but the animals themselves have no color. Um, and they, similar to the bryozoans that we talked about before, have these little, little hairs that they are able to reach out and grab things with that are in the water column. Here's a couple other pictures. The left one, you can see the more pincushion looking form to it growing on a stick that was in um, Edith Lake in Florence County and the right one was from Wadley Lake in Marathon County. Um, maybe the biggest sponge that I've ever seen, the thing was easily a foot long. Uh, you can see it growing off of a branch there in fairly deep water. Um, for the most part, sponges don't move once they form. They have a similar structure to the statoblast that I talked about with the bryozoan colonies. They have basically a dormant cell that falls off and starts a new colony the following year. And uh, once they start developing, they don't move. They, they stay attached to that rock or that plant or that log. And uh, that's really the rule with the freshwater sponges. There is one family of sponges called the hermit crab sponges that are the only real exception. Uh, they don't live in freshwater, but they actually colonize hermit crab shells. And it's a way for the sponges to not be stationary in one location. They move around wherever the hermit crab goes. So it's a way for them to, to stay in new areas and not exhaust the food supply in, in one small area. Um, dragonflies are a really interesting group that's uh, fairly diverse in Wisconsin. 120 species are uh, approximately are here. And these are the supreme flyers of the insect world. They can go forward and they go backward. They can do loops. They can go straight up. Uh, they can fly any way they want. And uh, for the most part, they live for, uh, in our area, mostly for a single year. But there are a bunch of species that do migrate, just like the birds do to the southern US and other places that are warmer. Uh, many of our dragonflies, particularly the darners, a swamp darner, the green darner, other large darner species will actually migrate to the Gulf Coast for the winter and they come back. So the first ones that you see in the spring tend to be the darners because they have flown their way back instead of having to go through uh, the hatching and development and everything in the springtime. Um, so you'll see those first and then you see the other species starting to show up later on in the, in the late spring. So uh, on the screen here, you can see a dragonfly nymph on the left. Sometimes those are used for fishing bait and you may hear them called helgramites. A uh, helgramite is actually a common name for a completely different insect that lives in streams. Um, so that's a little confusing, but um, that is a, a fully aquatic version of a dragonfly that lives underwater, sometimes for multiple years. 
and they are predatory in the water. So they're eating any kind of a little invertebrate that they can fit in their mouth. Um, or actually they don't need to fit in their mouth because they'll just shred it up into smaller pieces and then put it in their mouth. Uh, in the middle, you can see one of those nymphs has crawled up onto the dock here at, uh, at Kemp Station and Woodruff on Lake Tomahawk. Um, it, it digs those little claws into the wood and then dries out in the air and the sun. Uh, as it dries, the skin on the back cracks and then the adult dragonfly pops out of that hole in the back. So it'll pop out and reach up onto the dock and dry out for anywhere from a half an hour to an hour and a half, depending on the humidity and whether it's in the sun and that sort of thing. But once it dries out completely and then the wings are fully stretched and dried, then it can take off and fly. This is a slow motion movie of a, a fairly mature nymph of a dragonfly. So it's still fully aquatic, but it has not hatched out yet. This is one that I just had as sort of a pet uh, many years ago. And what you see in the top of the video frame there is a tweezers holding an isopod, which is another aquatic invertebrate that I'm feeding to my pet dragonfly. So I'll let you shoot let you see how fast th this thing can shoot out its mouth parts, even though it's slowed down to 250 frames per second. Um, you can also see how strong that jaw is. When they fire that out, the, the insect can actually pull its entire body weight up to the tweezers. So a uh, very vicious predator of small invertebrates in the aquatic systems. All right. Uh, we are just about to 1245, so that's that's good. I'm I'm close to being on time here. Um, I'm going to check the chat, and uh, if anybody has a question and would like to just unmute themselves and and ask a question, that would be totally fine too. Okay. I'll start with a couple of chat questions. Um, Dick asked, is the bowfin a rough fish? Uh, I don't believe they are considered rough fish. A rough fish is actually a, a, an actual classification in terms of fishing regulations. I do not think they're considered a rough fish for that purpose. I have a question. Okay. Is the six spotted fishing spider also known as the wolf spider? No. A wolf spider is a, the wolf spiders are in a completely different family of spiders. Um, they look kind of similar. They're dark, they're hairy, they're pretty big, um, but it is a different group of spiders. All right, I see a, a few more questions in the chat. Um, some of them I, I don't know at what time or what, what they were referring to. Um, so Scott had asked, do you see a quick spread like zebra mussels? Um, Scott, if you can clarify what you were talking about at the time. Uh, I can yeah, Paul, that was uh, for the jellyfish. Do you see those transported by boats and you no, know, similar to zebra mussels and uh, Eurasian water milfoil. Okay, sure. So the jellyfish are believed to spread as polyps and most likely on wood, which seems to be a preferred place for them to settle out and grow. So um, it's unlikely that you'd find them attached to a trailer or something like that. They could maybe be moved if you moved a chunk of wood or a rock from one lake to another or something like that. Um, that's how they're believed to have spread across the world. They were first showing up in botanical gardens and other displays where there were large ponds and people were shipping driftwood and um, big root systems of water lilies and things like that between countries or between locations around the world. And they would plant this into some kind of a water display, some big tank, and all of a sudden there'd be jellyfish in there. So uh, it seems that the wood is the most likely way that they are moving around, not just through a little bit of water transport or even probably not even an aquatic plant piece that would be moving from one lake to another. Uh, and Scott, you also asked, are the nutrients derived primarily from the roots? Were you thinking of pitcher plants? Right. 
Okay, so um, pitcher plants live typically in really acidic, nutrient-poor areas like bogs. And so they get the majority of their nutrition from eating insects. Um, they can survive without eating, but they don't grow as quickly. Um, they use the sun for photosynthesis, but a lot of the nutrients and minerals that they really require to be healthy are not readily available in the bog environment that they grow in, so they, they use the insects to supplement their diet in that way. Um, Scott, you also asked if freshwater sponges are good indicators of good water quality. Yes, they are considered indicators of good water quality. And Kevin asked if there are poisonous spiders in Wisconsin. Uh, the only one I'm aware of is the brown recluse, which is a non-native spider that uh, is typically found in really dark, moist areas like uh, wood piles and, and things like that. Um, I believe they are somewhat restricted to the southern part of the state. We're getting a little outside my area of expertise here, but um, I believe the brown recluse has been found in Wisconsin before, um, and that's the only one that I'm aware of. All right, I think I got to all the questions that were in the chat. If there is anyone that uh, typed a question that did not hear it answered, uh, you can certainly unmute and, and ask your question. Or if anyone has other questions, please ask those now. Um, before you sign out, if you do have ideas for webinar topics for next year, please let me know. And I'd be really interested in any feedback on today's webinar too. If you liked it, if you had problems with the audio, if you thought it was too long or whatever you think, um, please do share any feedback with me. Um, Dave asked a question in the chat just now, are there recorded sessions somewhere? There are none yet. This will be the first one and it will be on the YouTube channel. So go to YouTube and search for UWEX Lakes and you'll find our Extension Lakes YouTube channel and it'll be on there. I'll it's send out a link also to the, to the CLMN list when it's posted. Comment before we close here, I thought the webinar was very well done and the link was perfect. I think it was very informative and I would definitely listen to another one. Okay, awesome. Thank you. You bet. All right, well, I will stop the recording here and uh, sign off. So I'll be sending out an announcement early next year with a list of topics that we'll be presenting on webinars in 2020. So look for that to come soon.